Time is important to us. And it, when you were in school, you spent a lot of time trying to learn how to tell time. Now, a lot of you now are just really at a disadvantage because you've grown up in the digital age when clocks tell you what time it is. Uh, your watch will beep. Uh, there'll be a digitalized voice that will call out the hour. But when I was in school, back when we had to walk to school in the snow uphill both ways, um, we had to make our own little clocks. And we were given a paper plate. Uh, some of you are flashing back now, aren't you? You got a paper plate. And you had one of those little brass brackets that they always pass out in vacation Bible school. And you had to cut out the hands of the clock. And you had to make sure one was longer and one was short. And so, you know, to, just to be sure, you had real one long, it was off the pie plate. And the other, it was a little bitty short, barely stuck on there at all. And you put that on there, and then you had to write the 12s. Uh, numbers on there and get them spaced right and then the teacher would call out a time and you'd have to move your little hands around and, and show her that you could tell time could you put the big hand in the right place and the little hand in the right place and she would walk around uh, like a Gestapo guard and embarrass you if you couldn't tell time and shame you because you had the big hand in the wrong place and all your other friends would laugh at you because you couldn't tell time and they would have to spend a whole nother week on the AM PM thing that was another struggle altogether but now when you get a little older you realize that the easiest thing to do is to tell time but the hardest thing to do is to know what time it is that's a whole nother question is this a time to speak or is this a time to be quiet? Your wife says, how do I look in this dress? You better know what time it is. <laughs> is this a time to make a stand or is it time to sit and wait? Is this a time for action or a time for patience? Writer of Ecclesiastes, asked this question a long time ago, reminding us that one of the most important things we can do is to learn what time it is. Ecclesiastes third chapter, stand with me now in honor of God's word. There's a time for everything, a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search, a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, be very careful then how you live, not foolishly, but wisely, knowing how to make the most out of every opportunity for these days are evil. Because of this, do not be foolish, but know the will of God. Or as the King James interprets it, redeem the time. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. As patiently as our elementary teachers worked with us so we could know how to tell the time. Patiently, Father, teach us to know what time it is for us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Ecclesiastes is one of the latest books of the Old Testament that we have. It was, we think, written 
uh, much, much later than, than the other books. That's a very frustrating book to read because it keeps bringing up problems, but it really doesn't help you with any solutions. Uh, it, it gives you all kind of helpful things like Ecclesiastes of knowing what time it is. It tells you what good does it do to become rich because you will die and your children will spend it all. Uh, that's in there. Uh, all, all kind of frustrations of the life. It's vanity. It's all vanity. Uh, one of the best ways to understand this, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, is to see it as the transitional book from the idea that we can live our lives good enough, well enough, to be accepted by God. Uh, it, it's, it's one of the first understandings of the futility of human effort, that no matter how hard we try to do the good thing, will end up somehow in there messing it up. And we know that from our own. I mean, today's problems are yesterday's solutions. Uh, we thought it would be a good idea to have a clean source of energy. So we found out that we could, we could make ethanol from corn. Well, that's great. We can, corn is renewable. We can grow lots of corn. We'll make ethanol. Well, we also make bread with corn. And now we have priced bread almost out of reach of some people in some countries because we're using more corn for ethanol. That's a good idea, but it had bad consequences. No matter what we do, no matter how hard we try, there seems to be an awful downside to it. This is the thing that Ecclesiastes is pointing out to us, and it sets us up for the coming of Jesus and for him showing you can't do it by yourself. You have to be reborn. You have to learn to rethink and relive in a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's the questions, a lot of them, for which Jesus is the direct answer. So it's, it's a kind of seen as a transitional book uh, between the two covenants, between the Old Testament and the New Testament and the, and the message of the gospel in Jesus Christ. Now, the, this book has a lot of very good practical information. And this is one of them. And he points out there's an appropriate time for everything. Now be real careful how you read that. A lot of us hear that and see that and says we have time to do everything. That's not what he says. We live in a culture that wants us to defy our limitations. We have limits. You can only do so much. You only have so much time to do it. You have seven days in a week. You have 24 hours in those days. In those days, you have the opportunity to do the things that you choose to do. But you can't do everything. You don't have the talent. You don't have the ability. You don't have the opportunity. You don't have the resources to do everything. Now, we live in a culture that says you can have it all, you can do it all if you just manage yourself and do what you want to do. And we have driven ourselves to distraction trying to keep up with this false understanding of success. We do not manage time. I know we've all been to those seminars where we can time management. And we're told about how to break our projects down into bite-sized chunks and how to get them scheduled and all of that. But we don't manage time. Uh, they're trying to manage the Mississippi River right now by controlling the rate of the flood. And so they're opening it up, uh, spillways and levees to try to, to handle that flood. They're controlling the Mississippi, trying to. You can't control time like that. We can't speed it up. We can't slow it down. We can't make it do anything different other than what time does. Uh, we can't say to time, I'm really enjoying this, slow down. We can't say to time, I'm really hating this, speed up. In fact, it works the opposite, doesn't it? If you're having a real good time, you want to, oh, I want to save this moment forever, zip, it goes by. Takes forever for Christmas to get here. And then Christmas, zip. You can't control it. What you can control is you. You manage you. And what you do with your time determines, is determined by your priorities, by what matters to you, and that's where you make the investment. But you can't do everything. But you have to, have, you have to know what time it is to do what you think is important. Did you also notice that these things are directly opposite of each other? Diametrically opposed. You literally can't do them at the same time. You can't sew something up and tear it at the same time. You can't dance and mourn at the same time. Although some of us dancing, it may look like we're grieving, but 
You can't do both at the same time. You can't throw away and pick up at the same time. There is a time to do one or the other, but not both. There's a time for letting go and a time for grabbing hope. And this is one of those days when be, both will be going on. Our, our seniors will be letting go of high school. And there's a grief involved in that. There's a sadness. Uh, I, but this is an important transition. You have to let go of high school. Because a lot of us know friends who never let go of high school. And it's sad when you're 45 and 50 and have never let go of high school. You have to let go of the past so you can grab hold of the future. These are necessary transitions. You have to know what time it is for you. Just as there are seasons in nature, there are seasons in your life. Now, the challenge is these seasons don't necessarily line up with the seasons on the calendar, but there are seasons to our lives. We have winter, we have spring, we have summer, and we have fall. Now, it may happen in a whole different month than it's happening everywhere else in the world, but these are natural cycles that God has given to us for the living of our lives. Each season does an important thing. Each season is necessary, and you have to know what time it is, what season it is for you to maximize the opportunities. There is spring. Spring is the starting of new things. It's the planting of new seeds. It's the anticipation of new outcomes and new harvest. And it's a lot of work. Spring is a lot of work. Yes, there's a lot of excitement, but there's a lot of work. You have to break the ground. You have to plant the seed. You have to make sure the water is getting to the plants. You have to prepare everything for the coming harvest. And you have to plant, be sure that you do it when it is spring. Summer, it's too late to plant. Fall is a time of harvest, not planting. But you may be in spring, which is the time of beginnings. Now, we live in a culture that tells us that it is always spring. It's always an opportunity for growth. We should always be growing. That's not true. Nature has a word for things that are growing out of control. You know what that word is? Cancer. Cancer are cells that are growing out of control. And we live in a culture that says you should always be busy, always be growing, always be starting something new, always be anticipating, always in this anxious kind of effort to make something new happen. Spring is wonderful. And if you're in spring, work hard. Summer is when you work the seeds that you planted. The days are long and they are hard and they're hot. But you spend a lot of time making sure that the weeds aren't eating your seeds up. You spend a lot of time making sure that your seeds are cared for with water and fertilizer. There's a lot of hard work to make sure that the new thing that you're starting is happening. Fall. Fall is the harvest. Projects come to an end. Work comes to an end. And we celebrate the harvest. We celebrate what God is doing through us and around us. We celebrate then. All that God has been working through us. We enjoy it. We take time and relish it. We tell stories. We bring our friends in. We share that. But it's not a time of starting new. It's a time of things coming to an end. And winter? Winter does some important work. The roots go deep in winter. The earth is replenished and prepares for spring. It catches its breath. It nourishes itself. And things die in winter. Now that's hard for us, isn't it? We want everything to keep on going all the time. It can't. There's not enough space in your life. There's not enough time in your life. There's a necessary time to let things go. I was stunned a few weeks ago when some of the young ladies showed up at Kairos in bell bottoms. There is a time for things to die. 
I looked at him and I said, if I had known y'all were going to dig them up, we would have buried them deeper. <laughs> That's a hard moment, isn't it? To realize that something that has been part of your past can no longer be part of your future. It doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. I mean, there are some things that have been painful. There are some things that have been hurtful that we need to let go. We don't need to carry that burden or that grudge around anymore. And you can't keep carrying that and be ready for what God wants to do in spring. You have to let it go. But sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it's been, it's been fun. It's been, it's been helpful. It's made you stronger. But you have to let that go so that you can do something that works now. You're a different person than you were. You have different challenges, you have different opportunities, and you have different needs. So let winter do its work. Don't try to start anything new. Don't try to make something happen. Winter is the time when God, through his spirit, calls you to quiet. Calls you to a time, yes, of grief. Calls you to, to a time of nourishment and preparation. You need to know what time it is for you. It may be winter, and if it's winter, good. Important things happen in winter. Let winter do its work. It may be spring, and if you've had a good winter, the soil is ready for new beginnings. You're nourished, you're ready, the field is cleaned out, you can start something new and exciting. It may be summer, which is hard, hard work, busy time, and it may be fall. If it is, celebrate. Something has come to an end. If you finished a project, ended the time of mission, celebrate. This has been a good time and some good things have happened. Celebrate the harvest and get ready for winter. You have to know what time it is for you. Now, how do you tell that time? What clock do you watch? Is there, is there somewhere where it's written down? You know, at least with the seasons, there's, there's Richard's Almanac, and it'll tell you, this is when winter's starting. This is, or, or the weatherman will come on and say, hey, today's the first day of spring, and it's 28 degrees. How do you tell what time it is for you? Paul reminded the Ephesians that in order to know what time it is, so you could redeem the time, you had to do that in the context of knowing God's will. There is this image of space and time and this current of God's will running through space and time, of God working situation after situation, circumstance after circumstances, person after person, to accomplish his good and ultimate will that will be completed with the coming of Christ. That Christ will establish his kingdom and will be part of that, but, but, but until then, there is this current of God's will that is working. Sometimes it's working in ways we can see and celebrate. Sometimes it flows underneath and it's hard to find, but it is nonetheless still there. Paul says in order to know what time it is, you have to know what, time, what, what the will of God is. You have to know what God is doing in and around you, in situations around you. So you can align your life, put your life in the center of this current of God's will. As God is working in those situations, he will make you part of his work. And as part of his work, there'll be a time for you to speak and a time to be quiet. There'll be a time to embrace and a time to refrain based on what God is doing in the moment. So that means the first thing you and I have to do to begin to understand what time it is, is to start aligning our life with God's will. Now, everybody has a question. Boy, Mike, if I just knew what God's will was, as it is some deep and mysterious secret. 
Uh, as if you have to climb some mountain or go on some great adventure of a pilgrimage and then find, oh, finally, I have found God's will. Let me be real blunt with you. You know three things right now God wants you to do. You know three things he wants you to do. Now, it may be repair a relationship. It may get back into the Bible study that you started but quit. It may be to call a friend that you know is hurting. Uh, it may be to spend some quality time with your wife or husband or one of your children who needs some special attention right now. You know three things. Do those. And God will tell you the next three. But God sometimes is like the old country preacher who showed up at the new church. Y'all heard this story, didn't you? Preach the same sermon for the first six weeks. Deacons pulled him aside and said, that's a good sermon, but we'd like to hear another one. He said, do what I'm telling you to do in this one, then I'll preach the next one. <laughs> oh, y'all hadn't heard that? I would have played that really hard. I didn't. <laughs> Why will God tell you three more things to do until you do the three things you know? You always think that it's going to be this, this big flash of light and God's going to say, here's the end of the chapter, here's the end of the book, and here's how you're going to get there. It's not that way. It's one step at a time. It's one day at a time. First to the disciples was the call, follow me. That's it. Not where, not how long we're going to be gone, not what we're going to do. The simple question is, are you going to follow me? If you follow me, then you'll find out the answer to all these other questions. But first, you have to decide to follow me. See how that goes? The first question, answer that one, then you'll know the next one. Step by step, day by day, staying in the center of God's will, you will arrive at the place, the destination that he is taking you to. But it's never the big moment where you understand everything. It's always step by step and day by day, you get the manna you need for the day. And in knowing God's will and moment by moment, you'll know what time it is for you. Our world has two words that I could throw around about time. One is efficient, and that is doing things right. Um, the quick use of time, getting things accomplished. And we, we all go to seminars, we're all worried about how we can be more efficient in the use of our time and, and what gadget can we get that will help us use our time more efficiently and, and, and what plan can we use that will help us use our time more efficiently. And, and, and the problem with that is, is that we'll end up being really, really efficient in the wrong thing. We'll be really, really fast in the wrong race. The other word is a more important word. It's the word effective. Are you doing the right things? You speak, scripture calls us to be an effective use of our life. Paul to the Ephesians talks about redeeming the time. The coin of time is given to you and you choose then how to invest it. Are you going to invest it in those things that make a difference that last? Um, Paul talks about a judgment where the acts and the deeds of, of the faithful are tested. And they're tested by fire and those works that are straw are consumed, burned up. Those that are gold are refined and made more pure. So are you investing your coin? Are you redeeming your time for those things that last or those things that will be consumed? Effective. Efficient. The Bible has different words. Same idea. The uh, Bible has two words for time. Chronos, which is chronology, which is the time, uh, quarter to twelve, that kind of thing. The other is kairos, which means the right moment, the right moment to pick a piece of fruit or the timing of a joke. The Bible talks about knowing the kairos and the fullness of time. God acts. When everything was ready, God did this in the fullness of time, in the Kairos moment. The most important thing you can do is learn to tell the time. What time is it for you? 
And you can only know that time in a relationship with Jesus Christ. So can you tell the time? Do you know what time it is for you? There's a time for everything under heaven. But do not live foolishly, but make the most out of every moment. Know what time it is for you.